Hello folks, welcome back. Today we've got a, a great program. We have Mr. Chris Anderson from the Oregonian. I'd like to uh, make a brief announcement that if you are watching this on television, we have an email list. And if you go to WashingtonCountyForum.org, you can sign up for our email newsletter. We hit you about once a week with upcoming events like the one that we have today. Uh, and what I'd like to do is ask you now to please put your hands together for Mr. Chris Anderson, publisher of the Oregonian. Thank you very much, Eric, and uh, thank you all of you for uh, coming today. And I'm pleased to be here. I, I uh, live about 500 yards from Washington County, so I spend a lot of time in, in Washington County, and probably more time than I spend in, in Portland, actually, and I am delighted to be here. You know, I, um, I wanted to show you something today. This is the Oregonian from February 17th of 1958. It's a little bit yellow, and um, it was $1.95 a month back then. I, I, used to, I used to deliver the Oregonian where I grew up in, in Hepner, out in the middle of nowhere in eastern Oregon. It was $1.80 a month back then, and I used to get stiffed regularly by customers who claimed they had paid me already, but it was, it was good. Well, I'm not going to talk a lot about history today except to note that the Oregonian has been in business for 163 years and continues today to publish a newspaper seven days a week. So there is a lot of history in our company, but we're in the midst of great change. And that's what I'd like to share with you today and to, uh, uh, to respond to what you have to say about it as well. I know that I've, uh, I, I could talk for a long time, but I'm not going to do that this afternoon because I, I want to uh, engage in conversation with you. You know, like the rest of the world, I think, uh, I would say that the Oregonian and now the Oregonian Media Group, our new company, is obviously in the midst of great, a great change. And that change comes from the way people expect and consume news and information. And as a result, news organizations like ours, like Oregonian Media Group, are changing and adapting, and they must, and they will. So there's three points I'd like to, to talk about today, and they all revolve around change and the, and the things that are going on. And yes, we have changed. At the heart of what we do, however, we have not changed, and that is to provide information for engaged citizens. That shared information helps all of us talk about the future of our communities here uh, in the Portland metropolitan area and around Oregon. That has not changed. So there's three things, as I said, that I'd like to note today. One is how we are changing to reflect our customers, how our customers uh, want and need information and advertisers reaching customers. The second thing I want to talk about is our journalism. Our journalism is alive and well. And the third thing I want to talk about is our business and how our business is alive and well. Lots of things being said about our company these days, and many of them untrue. There are lots of myths. So I hope you'll bear with me as I share some of those myths and uh, try to correct the record, if that's okay with all of you. That's kind of the business that we're in, is trying to have a correct record. Don't always succeed, but in this case, I get to say what I get to say, right? <laughs> you got the mic. So, one of the myths is that the Oregonian is going out of business, that we are losing money. That is not true. We are profitable, and we will be profitable in 2013, we'll be profitable in 2014. We were profitable in 2012, 2011, and 2010. We lost money in 2008 and 2009, prior to my arrival. 
I might note. It sounds a little self-serving, but what the heck. Actually, uh, today is just about my fourth anniversary with the company. Although I grew up, among other things, delivering the Oregonian in my hometown of, of Hepner out in eastern Oregon. So I go back a long way with, with the Oregonian. 50 years or more, I guess, probably. Well, in our house in eastern Oregon, we had the Oregonian delivered every day. So when I was born, um, a couple days later, there was the Oregonian. So, yes, we did lose money in 2008 and 2009, and really, one of the primary responsibilities I had when I came to the Oregonian was to create financial stability for this company and to position it in a way that we could go forward and continue to serve people in the metropolitan area and across our state in southwest Washington with the kind of stability that we needed, the strength that we needed to have uh, to be able to do the work that we do. Our long-term strategy, of course, is to be profitable and to do so in a way that allows us to grow, to be able to add more people to our news gathering force, and how can we possibly do that given what's happened with print media? Well, that's why we are in the midst of change to a digitally focused media company, Oregonian Media Group. Yes, we deliver the Oregonian four days a week and we print it seven days a week. It's available on newsstands and some people are getting it home delivered seven days a week. They've made arrangements with their carriers to be able to do that. Our household is one of those. On the days where we home deliver, those four days, we have very robust newspapers. I've had a lot of people tell me that the Wednesday paper feels like a Sunday paper. Loaded with news, loaded with advertising. And in fact, we've added another section to the, to the newspaper on Wednesday, our health and fitness section. Friday is another big day. We added another section to the Friday paper on, uh, in September, our prep section, our prep sports section. Sunday, we added a separate opinion section. That's not really new because we used to do that some years back, but we haven't done that for a while. So we added a six-page opinion section to the, to the Sunday paper. Saturday is a day where we have two sections to the regular paper plus our homes and gardens section and our classified section and we do a lot of emphasis on high school sports in the Saturday paper as well. There's been a lot of talk about uh, cutting back on resources and cutting back on, on the, the number of people reporting the news. And it's true that our news staff is smaller than it was five years ago. But in June when we made the announcement about our change, we had 90 reporters on our staff. Today we have 91, and we hope that number will grow. Where have we made cuts? We've made cuts in staff who are responsible for producing the paper, the, the print edition, if you will. That's where we made our cutbacks. We had not had any re reduction in staff uh, since 2010 when, we'd had some other, when we had some other uh, reductions in our staff. So our business is focused on how do we maintain the quality of our work and how do we maintain uh, the kind of advertising support that we need to be able to continue well into the future. I don't pretend to come here today and tell you exactly how much money we're going to make or to tell you exactly how long we're going to have a print edition of the Oregonian. I think that's, uh, that the marketplace will decide that. But I can tell you that our strategy, focused on being a digitally focused media company and a print edition as well, is a long-term strategy. It's not something that is intended to say, today we home deliver four days a week, next year we'll go to three, and the year after that two. We have, we have no plans whatsoever. The strategy and the financial picture, all of the things that we did are focused on sustaining this business model and growing it. And how are we going to grow that? Obviously, we're going to grow that through the growth of digital advertising revenue. We have no plans today to charge anybody for access to our information online. Long time ago, when I was beginning to get into the business side of, of this uh, industry, the publisher that I worked for said to me, now remember one thing, you can't you can't sell what you give away for free. 
So here we are practicing this wonderful business model of giving away all of the information that we put on Oregon Live today for free. And it is robust. It's a lot more than goes into print. But we don't have any plans to change that. I can't say that that's really a long-term strategy. A number of, of other companies like ours are charging for access to information on the Internet. But it's not in our, it's not in our plan. So how do, we, how do we make money and how does this business plan work? When I said that our company is alive and well, how, how is what we have done and what we intend to do make any sense from a financial picture? First of all, obviously we have reduced expenses related to publishing, printing that is, and distributing newspapers on the three days a week when we had almost no advertising. And, and I, I will clarify that by recognizing that Tuesday was a great day for advertising in the form of pre-printed inserts because uh, that was largely food advertising. That's all moved to Wednesday, so we've kept all of that. So we've reduced, uh, we've reduced the, the cost of printing and distributing newspapers on three, the three days a week when we had the least amount of advertising. I like to think that if you looked at the Monday newspaper over the past few months, you'd see that there was almost no advertising in it except for um, a hearing aid advertiser. And uh, the good news is that, that hearing aid advertiser is now running on Sunday. So we kept that and we eliminated that expense. So the rest of the picture relates to, aside from reducing those, those expenses that are significant related to distribution of the print product, is the opportunity for us to grow the revenue that we get from selling digital advertising. And I want to give you a sense of, of how that compares to what we do in print. Print is still the big, vast majority of our revenue. But in fact, digital revenue is growing year over year in double digit form. Last year we were up about 35%. This year we expect to be up 36% year over year in terms of digital revenue. Why can we do this? How does it work? First of all, it reflects the changing nature of our audience, where people are getting their news, how they're consuming it, and how advertisers are moving dollars into digital revenue from all sorts of other places, including print. Last month, October, Oregon Live had six million, more than six million unique visitors. Now compare that to the readership of the Sunday Oregonian, which is about 800,000, 6 million. So if you think about the population of Oregon, everybody in Oregon is looking at Oregon Live, and then a whole bunch more people as well. And that was a gain last month of more than 20% from, um, from September alone. And year over year, again, up about 25%. We had 40, 40 million, 41 million actually, individual page views on Oregon Live. 41 million times people looked at, at a page or more on Oregon Live. And that's a 30% 30, uh, 30 increase year over year. So that tells you where the audience is, and it tells you where our opportunity is to help advertisers reach that big, vast market. And that big, vast market is growing, and the market for print is not. Why is that? That's simply a matter of changing habits of people. Now, as I look around this room, we're in, uh, most of us are in a similar uh, age category, right? And I know what you're all going to say, but not me. But not me, right? And I, I, uh, I know, I think, as much as just about anybody else, including, I suspect, all of you, what it what the difference is between the tactile feel of a newspaper in your hands, especially at the breakfast table, 
and the notion of consuming that same information and more in digital form. I don't make any mistake about it. I am happy to stand here and say I understand how we have disrupted habits of many of our most loyal customers in changing our home delivery to four days a week from seven days a week. I understand that quite clearly. My, uh, my mother and father died in the past year and I, I have I, the, the only solace I take in that is that my mother is not alive to yell at me <laughs> on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. You know, they, they lived down, uh, they lived down uh, in Dallas, just outside of Salem. And every time I went to visit them, which was pretty regular, uh, they were sitting in their chairs in the family room reading a newspaper. And it uh, might have been the Oregonian, it might have been the uh, Oregon Statesman, the Statesman Journal from Salem, might have been a weekly newspaper from Dallas or another one. So I recognize that we have disrupted that habit. And uh, we've heard from just about everybody, I think, whose, whose habits we have disrupted. I don't take that lightly. I really don't. But I understand from a strategy standpoint that that is not where our future is. Our future is really in how people are consuming information. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the print editions that we do home deliver still have a, a robust amount of information. Now the question also arises as a result of all of this, have you, you know, have you cut back on coverage, have you cut back on people, that it's not real news if it's not in print. I can't tell you how many times I have heard that. Part of the change of what we are doing is delivering information in new forms and in new ways. And I have to say that in almost every case, it is more robust than what we could ever do in print. And I want to give you an example of that. We did a series, you may recall, just recently, just in the past uh, few weeks, on uh, registered sex offenders in Oregon and how Oregon has become a haven for sex offenders who don't bother to register, uh, who move freely around the state without any accountability, and because of the way that we don't keep track of sex offenders, Oregon has become a, somewhat of a, a magnet for them. So we can tell that story in print, but we told that story in a much more full way, a much fuller way online. We had interactive maps where you could go and look. We had video. We had all sorts of things that just can't play out in print. And yet, we did a pretty good job of explaining it all in print. But the fact is that there was a lot more information that was available because we have a website and because we have mobile sites, because we have many ways of sharing information that we did not have just a few years back. The same thing applies to the series that we did about Mexican drug cartels in Oregon video, maps, links to other stories that we had done, things that you couldn't possibly do in print. You couldn't possibly take the space to do that in print. And so, again, delivering on the print promise, but opening up so much more that we're able to provide for people. One of the questions arises as well about whether we are, in fact, uh, doing the same quality of journalism that we used to do. On October 1st, when we made the change to the Oregonian Media Group, one of the things we did was reconstitute an investigative reporting team. And just about uh, 10 days ago, we added another member to that team, someone who had been with us and left and came back. His name is Jeff Manning. He used to cover a lot of white-collar crime for us. Uh, for some reason, he got this crazy idea that he wanted to go and be um, a PR person for the Oregon Department of Justice. And that lasted for about uh, a year, and he came to his senses and said, I want to come back and do real journalism. So we've added another person to our investigative team. It brings us to six people now. And that work is going to continue and be uh, represented both in print and uh, in, our, in our digital forms as well. So the notion that somehow we're not, we're not covering the news or that we've backed off from covering the news, I just... I believe that's a myth, and I, and I see it in the work that we do every day. For people who do not consume everything in digital form, I understand the difference. You may not see everything that you used to see, 
But it's there, and it's there 24-7 on OregonLive.com. Part of our strategy, too, has been to deepen our coverage of individual communities. So part of our strategy in Washington County was to create new weekly newspapers. Since 1985, we owned the Hillsboro Argus, which uh, most of you would know is a, is a two-day-a-week paper. Last October, we launched the Forest Grove Leader, and in May, we launched the Beaverton Leader. I want to tell you what we did as part of that. We now have about 25 reporters in Washington County. I should say staff, because not all of those are reporters, but reporters and editors and photographers in Washington County. And our commitment to covering uh, local communities has never been stronger than it is today. Why is that? Because this fits into the big picture of what distinguishes us in this world today. And that is information that is local in nature that you probably aren't going to get anywhere else. So people ask about, what about national and international news? Well, we still have some representation of that in the print product and some of that on Oregon Live as well. But what we can do and where we should spend our resources, we believe, is in covering Oregon like nobody else can. You know, I, I uh, as I said, I live, I live uh, close to Washington County and one of the things I do most every morning is drive down Canyon Road uh, to, um, uh, to work out at 24 Hour Fitness in Beaverton. And this morning I saw for the first time this really ugly billboard. It was for OPB. And it said, uh, we have news seven days a week and we will read it to you. <laughs> well, if you catch OPB at the right time, they'll read it to you. We're available 24-7. And by the way, uh, just to put a little bit of a point on that, OPB has four reporters. They have people on the air who are anchors. They have four reporters. We have 91. So where does OPB get its news? Uh, yeah, it does get news from the Associated Press. And who is the largest contributor to the Associated Press News Report in Oregon? Oregon. Yeah, we are. So when you hear news on OPB, uh, you're probably hearing our news that's been uh, rewritten for purposes of being on the air. So you know, somehow I'm going to figure out how we can get control of that billboard so we can put our own message uh, <laughs> up there. But. Uh, the journalism is at the heart of what we do. It's at the heart of what we do in, in Washington County. And when we, when we started these two new newspapers, the one in Forest Grove and the one here or in Beaverton, we made a conscious decision to deliver them to all households who wanted to get them. So in Forest Grove, for example, our competitor there has about 3,500 circulation. We have 17,000. In Beaverton, the Valley Times has about 4,500 circulation. We have 80,000 in Beaverton. So our goal is to bring more news to more people in more ways than we ever have in the past. And that includes local, local news, like here in Washington County and in other places around the metro area. And it includes the big picture things that we do that are part of covering Oregon and covering Oregon in ways that nobody else can do that. So that commitment is strong, and it is going to be stronger because as we position ourselves with the growth that we know that we can have through this digital audience that we are building and the revenue that comes along with that, we're going to be able to expand in, in, in ways that are different from what we were doing with the Oregonian where we were in the process of contracting for, for a number of years. I want to say a few things about what it means to be a digitally focused media company because I think that um, quite people ask questions about that and, and again, first of all I want to say that does not mean that we are abandoning print in any fashion, but we need to be better at how we deliver information to people in digital form. It might surprise you, might not, 
to know that about 40% of our digital visitors are coming through mobile devices now, either smartphones or tablets, in ways that we probably wouldn't have expected just maybe even a couple of years ago. But it is a big, huge audience, and by the way, uh, for better or for worse, that audience is a lot younger than the audience that was just online. So when we think about how we're going to build that audience, part of what we do is through the idea of the kind of content we have that addresses this much bigger, broader audience than we've ever had. One of the things that we just did, just did this last week, was to launch a new food and dining channel on OregonLive.com. It is, um, I think, an absolutely first rate, and I didn't build it, so I can say this, <laughs> a, a really first rate experience for users of Oregon Live to be able to go in and see information about every aspect of food and dining. We've created, uh, we've enabled it with technology that allows people to take information off the website, put it onto something called Zip List. If you want to create a shopping list, for example, you can do that. If you want to create a list of places you want to go, if you want to create a list of, of drinks that you've seen on the website, you can do that. All of this technology is enabled to allow people to be able to get information and use information in ways that they probably haven't before. We've launched new newsletters. We launched two new business newsletters, for example. We completely revamped our newsletters. So I don't know how many of you are getting newsletters, but I happen to subscribe to all of them, as you might imagine. And I get in my inbox every morning about uh, eight different newsletters. I get another newsletter in the afternoon, and then once a week I get a, a few more that are weekly newsletters. The idea is that we can give people a quick look at what are the top news stories of the day, what are the top business stories of the day, what are the top um, uh, sports stories of the day. And for those uh, folks who want to have their fix, we have the Comics and Puzzles newsletter as well. <laughs> so just by subscribing to those, you can get the full set of comics and, uh, and puzzles. I like it because in our household, we have two people who like to do the crossword puzzle. They don't always cooperate with each other. I haven't quite figured that one out, but um, you know, we have different paces and uh, different approaches to the crossword puzzle, my wife and I do. Fine, she can have hers, and I'll have mine. It doesn't take two newspapers to do that. Although, I'd be happy to deliver to uh, on Sunday for anybody who'd like that. We are introducing as well new apps for mobile devices. So we've introduced a new Oregon Live app for smartphones. We're about to introduce a new app for tablets as well for Oregon Live. We have a number of apps related to sports for the major college teams in the state, of course, prep sports as well. All of those things uh, speak to how we are changing the way we deliver news. As I said, it doesn't change our focus on what's important and our primary understanding of why we exist and that reason for existence is to be able to provide information for people to engage in civic conversations, just like this forum does and like you do in your everyday lives. You know, I recognize uh, some, of, s some folks who are very engaged in our forums, for example. Steve Buckstein is one of them, and, and Eric himself uh, uses our forums a lot. And I suspect that some of you do too, although I may not know you because you might not be using your real name uh, if, you, if you happen to comment on Oregon Live. That engagement is a way that we bring people together to have conversation. That engagement is a way that we can be useful to people. When you think about that six million unique visitors, we have a larger digital audience in Oregon than the next seven news organizations combined. Think about that. That speaks to our reputation, it speaks to, I think, our credibility. I think it speaks to the depth and breadth of what we're trying to provide for, for people here in the metropolitan area and throughout the state. You know, I understand uh, change. I, I think I've 
as I've reflected on my career, and I've, I've been doing this for uh, quite a few years, as I reflect on my career, it's been all about, uh, all about change. The day that I arrived at the Oregonian, November 2nd of 2009, I had a letter from a resident of Hefner, again, where I grew up. And this resident wanted to know if there's any way that we could resume home delivery in, in Hepner. I had a letter from a, a person in Baker City. Please bring back the Oregonian to, to Baker City. And the truth of the matter is, it just can't work that way today. It just can't work. I had, at, at, at best, at the top of my game in Hepner, I had 75 subscribers to the Oregonian. And I have to tell you that the cost of printing those newspapers and getting them distributed to Hepner, and you know, my 20 bucks a month that I made, was cost prohibitive. It was then, but the Oregonian had this sense that it had to be the paper that was home delivered in every place in Oregon. And the truth of the matter is, of course, that, in, that you can still get the paper seven days a week in, in Burns but you can't get it in Hepner, and we're not going to resume that. You can't get it in Pendleton every day, and you can't get it in Baker City, and it's just never going to happen again. But the good news is, for residents of those communities, all of our content, and vastly more than would ever be in print, is available in digital form. And I understand that not everybody wants to get their information in digital form. As I said, I know the tactile feel, I've, I've lived with it all my life, as, as, uh, as I suspect most of you have. But the world has changed around us. I have four kids and two in-laws, and it creates great sadness for me to know that none of them subscribe to a newspaper. None. The oldest is 35, the youngest is 24, and they are very literate and engaged citizens. They just don't get their information in print. If somebody had said to me 10 years ago that in 2013 you won't have Time, Newsweek, and U.S. World News and Report in print form, I probably would have lost the bet on that. And here we are today without, without that. So, uh, you know, one of those is still left in print on a weekly basis. And that one is not long for this world in that form. Somebody asked me, would the New York Times continue to print a newspaper forever? My answer with respect to every other newspaper is I only, I only publish one newspaper at a time. But I want to assure you that the day will come when the New York Times is probably delivered, home delivered on Sunday, made available in print on Sunday. All of its growth like all of our growth, is taking place in the form of digital subscriptions and digital revenue. Like every other publication in this country, of any size that is, print revenue is declining. Advertisers have moved their dollars into ways that can reach new audiences. Print revenue has declined over the past four years by 50%. Imagine what that does to your ability to sustain a news gathering team the size of ours or the size of those at, at other publications. And when you think about where that, has, where that has gone, let's just talk about classified advertising for a minute or two. I remember when I heard that, this, that the San Jose Mercury News had more than $100 million in employment advertising in print until 2003, and then it became 16 million. Today, I'll bet you that it's less than $2 million they have. Well, where did all that money go? It went online. So the revenue tells you the story, the audience tells you the story. Six million unique visitors to Oregon Live last month. Uh, again, the biggest audience we have on Sunday in print, 800,000. And that 800,000 is the same every week, pretty much. Doesn't, doesn't grow from week to week, doesn't change from week to week. So the challenges are clear to us. 
And so is our commitment clear to us. The way that we talk about our journalism, the way that we talk about how we can serve our customers best through delivering news in different ways, delivering more news. We have more voices in the Oregonian through OregonLive.com than we've ever had before. We have more comments, we have more letters to the editor, we have m many, many more things than we've ever had in the past. So we're focused on that because we know that's what our future is. I love print, I always will, and we intend to continue to deliver news in print. But it'll be, but it has become different, it will be different, and the world is different. All of those things come into play uh, to be able to have this kind of conversation that we want to have. Now, I'm going to give you one example, and it's one of, it's one of thousands that I could cite. We had an interesting blog last week by our sports columnist, John Canzano, about fans at, at the University of Oregon's football games. It's from an ex-player, I don't know how many of you saw this, but it was a letter from an ex-player in which he called out the fans at Autzen Stadium. And that just lit up immediately, as you can imagine. And there were a few Beavers fans making comments on there, too. <laughs> but, you know, it, it reached a thousand comments in, in just a few days. And most of those came in the, first, in the first day, the first couple of days. People devoured that information and wanted to have something to say about it. Was it the most consequential story? that we've had on Oregon Live? No, not, not at all. Not at all. Will it ever be? Not at all. But it's the kind of engagement that, that I can talk about. In addition to all of the things that we do about, about government, about business, about politics, and that's where we make a difference. One more example, and then I'll be happy to um, shut up and uh, and to hear what you have to say and to take and to take your questions. We had a special session of the Oregon Legislature on September 30th. Fascinating to us because October 1st was the first day in the history of the Oregonian that we would not home deliver a newspaper, right? On Tuesday. So the day came and we we're trying to figure out how we're going to make sure that the people of Oregon know. We staffed the Oregon legislature that day with about six reporters and a couple of photographers. So at six o'clock that evening, I went online to all of the news websites, well, not all, but almost all of the news websites in the metro area to see how people had covered that story of the Oregon legislature. Now, the Statesman Journal in Salem did a terrific job because that's their home, they're very focused on state government. They did a nice job. Willamette Week, not one word about the special session of the legislature. 6 p.m. the first day of the session. OPB, not one word on their website about the special session of the Oregon legislature. Three television stations had stories from the Associated Press. No video, no uh, original reporting on their part. So those are five examples of the ones, ones that I looked at. What did we have? We had a host of articles, opportunities for people to engage in the conversation, photographs, full coverage, but it was only in digital form. Now, the paper did come out the next day, of course, because we do publish even if we don't home deliver it. The paper did come out the next day, and we had nice coverage on it. But I have to say that there was much more coverage on Oregon Live than there was in print. We were kind of hoping when the session held over onto the next day that things would get resolved on that Tuesday, and lo and behold, Wednesday, we'd have a home-delivered paper. We could wrap it all up in print. But it was a turning point for us because, of course, as we all know, the session didn't end on Wednesday either. I mean, it didn't end on Tuesday either. It ended on Wednesday. And the next day, of course, we didn't have a home-delivered edition of the Oregonian. But we had this significant coverage and lots of people engaged in the conversation about it. So these are turning points. This is a turning time for us. This is a time when we, are, when we are very focused on the quality of journalism we do 
and the various ways that we're going to deliver that in print and in digital form. That's what our future is. That's going to allow us to continue in business. That's going to allow us to grow for the first time in a number of years in terms of the number of people we have gathering and delivering information. So that's why our focus is on this digital future. And again, why we want to be an essential part of the fabric of the lives of the people of Oregon. Thank you very much. Patrick Wheeler, forum member, thank you for coming today. And uh, thank you for improving Oregon Live. You guys had the worst website going until you changed it. And this is such a great improvement. And I'm curious, I've taken the Oregonian for 30 plus years. But the readability, where I, you know, where other newspapers have, you know, things where you can just tease you to come in and deep, dig deeper into the Oregonian or in their newspapers or articles. Why don't you do that in the uh, print edition, like you've done it on the website? Well, first of all, thank you um, for your comments about about Oregon Live, um, and I'm gonna I want to answer that in, in a way that perhaps um, might be of interest to, to to you. All of you are consumers of information. That's why you are here today, because you care about Washington County, and you're engaged in the community as well. So you consume a lot of information. Some people expect Oregon Live to be like the New York Times website. And I've probably heard more than twice, maybe more than three times, why don't you make Oregon Live like the New York Times website? And the reason is because I don't like the static nature of the New York Times website. It frankly rarely changes during the day. Oregon Live changes a lot, and Oregon Live reflects the fact that news is changing. And we have a lot more improvement to make. So I, I, I want to say that up front in recognition of, of Patrick's question. Why don't, we in, uh, why don't we invite more on in print in terms of the depth of information that we have? What we're trying to do in every case is drive um, to, to have the information, the, the essence of the information in print, and to encourage people to go to Oregon Live. What we haven't perfected yet, and again, we're still a, we're still a work in progress in both, in both the print product that we have and, uh, and the digital products we have, in terms of more uh, helping people understand what else is available. So it's, it is something that we are focused on and want to take advantage of to say in print, here are all the things that relate to this online that you can go to and, and get that additional information. We're not there yet, but we're, but we're working on it. So thank you for, for noting that and for suggesting that opportunity for us to, to improve Oregon Live. And there's more to come in terms of Oregon Live. We have made a number of improvements, but we're not where we want to be yet in terms of that user experience. So thank you. Bill Kroger, forum member. I do thank you for coming in today. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm encouraged. Uh, to hear that uh, you're making a profit, and I'm encouraged to hear that you have six million people looking at your on online, looking at the uh, newspapers. I uh, w one of my concerns nationally. I I used to be a journalist, and one of my concerns nationally is that is that the media around the country has helped us become a nation. Just because uh, something happens in Texas, I hear about it. You hear about it, and so it, it makes us closer in that regard. And with all the changes that are happening, people. They go online and they look at sports, so they go online and look at something they want, and, and that's fine. I'm not going to argue that. But, they, but, but without the print media anymore, you know, you used to be able to, you'd open the paper and you couldn't help but look at some of the news things and things that were going on. And it's all the change we're talking about. But I'm concerned about, you know, with, with, with people not knowing what's going on around the country and, and things like that or identifying, you know, we become a little bit more dysfunctional as a country. And I was just kind of wondering, it's sort of a philosophical thing, but I, I was just kind of wondering, you're right in the middle of all this and what you might hear about, about things like that. Thank you. That's a very thoughtful question and a thoughtful observation. The serendipity factor of print, of course, is a marvelous, marvelous thing. You don't know what you don't know 
you don't know what you're going to get until you open up the paper and, and see what's in there. And the truth of the matter is, of course, you can get very focused when you go into uh, focusing, thinking about digital content. You can get very focused because you can create a search that takes you to, to one specific thing. And the truth of the matter is, today, we don't have six million unique visitors because people are coming and consuming everything on our website, right? They're just not. Uh, one of the reasons we have that size of an audience and one of the reasons we have that many page views is because we get traffic driven to us through search. More than half of our audience comes from search, not from people who bookmarked OregonLive.com and come in there every day and, looked at, and look at it. Again, I think that the Oregon Live format allows you to have the serendipity that you have in print if you want to pay attention to it. But technology has created this opportunity for you to get very focused on one thing. I can go in, for example, and if I want to, I can go in and find things about a very specific topic, just like all of you can, without looking at anything else on the site. And a lot of times what the traffic is, where we get traffic, is from people who are given a link to an individual page on Oregon Live. And that is what they will consume and then they'll go away. <laughs> so the challenge for us is to present the information in a fashion that people will do that. But the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is that there are not very many people who sit and read a newspaper cover to cover. I remember watching when USA Today was created, and I was fascinated by this whole experience, this whole experiment, if you will, and I used to go once in a while and stand and watch people buy the paper and see how they would consume it. It was astonishing to me, and you could almost tell by the demographic, how people would buy the paper and throw away every section except one. Because that's what they were consuming. And in most cases it was sports, interestingly enough, uh, because they did such a great job with sports and created some opportunities for the rest of us to, to mimic them and, and uh, improve our sports coverage. So. I don't. I, I I share your concern about that. I can share your concern about people engaging in civic life, even in their own communities. So, I the best we can do is put the information out there and help people understand that what's available, and that it is available, and that it's worth their time and energy to find out about it. But you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Steve Buckstein, forum member. Um, one of the things I really value about newspapers, whether they're online or in print, is the editing function. Because all of us now, in this modern age, we can all go online, we can blog, we can comment, but how do you know that it's worthwhile to read it? We, we all have limited time. So I think the editing function of a newspaper is partly what draws me to it. And it's in terms of Oregon Live, where all the forums you're talking about, I mean, have generated tons of comments. Just in the last year, it seems like it's gone up by a factor of 10, which is good because people can engage. The problem I have, or I guess the suggestion or the question is, as you know, I, I put in an op-ed in, in June that was fairly controversial. It generated over 1,400 comments. But when I went back and looked, probably about 400 of them were totally gratuitous. You're an idiot. Or, or you're brilliant. You know, and they were attacking each other, attacking me, which doesn't add to the discussion in my view and what I would prefer is for the Oregonian, Oregon Live, and any site I comment on, leave all the substantive comments whether they disagree or not, that's the whole idea, but moderate so that people who are just gratuitously calling people names and that sort of thing don't clog up the, the real informational value. I'm wondering if you're looking at possibly doing that. Well Steve, first of all, I think you need to recognize uh, and this applies to me, not just you, a lot more people think we're idiots than think we're brilliant. <laughs> right? So if you did that count, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, but right now, in our case, we have made a decision as a company, not at Oregon Live, but at Advance, our parent company, that the Wild West is going to prevail. And the result of that is that uh, I get insulted regularly 
and you also, but less regularly. So uh, I hope and I have said that I think we should consider the idea of using Facebook or some other social media platform for people to log in. That's not foolproof because you can create a fake uh, Facebook account fairly easily. It's not foolproof, but it begins to create a little more accountability in terms of the conversation that's taking place. Um, some people think that all we care about is the page views and that somehow we every page view is worth a dollar or something like that. My God, I wish it were. <laughs> but in fact, page views are only worth what you can sell them for, and I guarantee you that we are not selling all 40 million page views to advertisers right at the moment, which speaks to the opportunity that we have. But those, those comments would be, I think, and I've said this, would be better and the conversation would be better if people were held accountable for, for their comments. There are occasions, of course, when people are able to say things and provide information that they couldn't if they had their name to it. I think that's also important, but you can do that offline as easily as you can do that online. Nothing eminent in terms of, of that change, so um, thicken up your skin, continue to blog, continue to offer, uh, in my opinions, and, and get ready for uh, you know some more nice, nice comments, or not so nice comments. I'm Barbara Wilson, I'm a member of the forum. I have couple of things I want to say. One, I really miss Jack Oldman's cartoons and the alternative that we're getting now I don't think are even half as good and I miss that a lot. Secondly, when you write news stories about politics I would really like to know who's responsible by name and sometimes the Oregonian publishes the name of the politician that's doing certain things but I would like more of that. And then the third thing, and I'll be quick here. My husband is a PERS person. He received retirement. And um, every morning I would pick up the Oregonian out of the driveway and open it, and it was during the time the legislature was in session. And over and over and over again on the front page in the editorial, the Oregonian was beating up on PERS recipients. And you have the bully pulpit. You have the power of communication. And PERS recipients like me do not have that power to browbeat the legislature. And I wonder it's almost like an ethical question, and I would like to hear your thoughts on this. I'm not saying that you can't give your opinion, but over and over and over again, it's just really too much. Well, th thank you for your thoughts. First of all, I would say that um, we miss Jack Oman too. He made a conscious decision to go to Sacramento, to the Sacramento Bee. He was, uh, his Probably his best friend was the editorial call, uh, cartoonist for the Sacramento Bee, and uh, his friend died. And Jack felt a special kinship there. We still run some of Jack's cartoons, uh, but of course we don't run them as frequently as we did when he was when he was cartooning for us. So that's the story of, of uh, Jack Oman. Jack, by the way, as you may know did very few cartoons that had anything to do with Oregon. They were virtually all on a national scale because he's syndicated and it was important for him to do things that would be used in other newspapers. Uh, I have to say that while he had a, a strong voice and an important voice for the Oregonian, he really didn't engage in, in matters Oregonian. So um, in that respect, He's doing just fine in Sacramento, and the things that he does that might have an interest to us and to Oregonians, we continue to run, run his cartoons. Uh, let me talk about PERS. Uh, I, the, the politics thing is, is an important one that you mentioned about reporting on the politicians. And I, and I, I take that as, a, as an important reminder to us to make sure that when we write about legislation and we write about activities of the legislature in particular, that we're sure to put names to 
to the actions that are being taken there. With respect to PERS, um, I understand that PERS recipients felt and perhaps continue to feel that the Oregonian was picking on them as individual recipients. And the truth of the matter is that our focus in both coverage of PERS, separated from our editorial opinions, was to explain to the people of Oregon the significant long-term costs of this program. So it wasn't about the individual recipients. We cited some of them, of course. We, we gave examples of the former football coach at the University of Oregon and his uh, significant PERS pension. We cited the case of a woman who was, and it's hard to imagine that this word is still used to describe somebody in 2013, but she was listed as a secretary uh, for the uh, Douglas County Fire Protection District. And she was allowed to have the same benefits as firefighters were, as an office worker. No different than somebody else in Salem who did office work, but because she was associated with that particular government entity, she got a pension benefit that other people didn't get. We cited her by name and her specific benefit. And we did that with, with several other people. We cited people who had left employment and had benefited uh, from, uh, who were inactive PERS recipients and who are going to benefit from, an, from a very significant pension when they retire. These were things that existed, that the legislature knew about, but not that many people in the state of Oregon knew about it. And at the same time, in the state of Oregon, in Washington County, in the Beaverton School District, we were laying off teachers left and right, and significant portion of that, uh, of a significant portion that explained why that was happening was because of the contribution that the school district had to make to the PERS system. And when people were talking about the size of classrooms, the loss of teachers, it was important for us to show where those costs were coming from. And PERS is a significant expense to the taxpayers of the state of Oregon. And we know, because we've reported it many, many times, that most PERS recipients get a $25,000 or $26,000 benefit. And then there are people who get a lot more than that. And the system is set up to recognize in ways that are far different from private pension plans. And who has a private pension plan anymore? I have a 401k plan, no, no pension plan. I contribute my own money, company matches part of it, and then I'm, uh, if I'm wise in how I, invest it, how I invest it, I might have some growth in that for when I retire. So it's very different. The PERS uh, system is very different from private industry. It was important to show how certain things play into the costs of the PERS system. The Oregonian made no changes in the PERS program, none whatsoever. The legislature did, led by the governor. And if somebody thinks that the Oregonian can dictate to the governor what actions he should take, let, let, let me know, because I was in a meeting with him the other day, and uh, he flatly uh, refused to follow my advice on something. So uh, I, know, I know that's how it happens. I'm sorry that you feel put upon, but um, I think the... I think the idea that somehow the Oregonian has the only voice in this is simply not correct. If you go to legislative hearings, the hearing rooms are loaded, loaded with people from the SEIU uh, who are trying to make the case with the legislature not to change a word. So yes, the Oregonian has uh, a big reach. But to suggest that we're the only people who have a voice, I just reject that idea because people have, uh, uh, union members in particular, have had a very strong voice in influencing the legislature. They continue to do it, and another way they do it 
is through the campaign contributions that they make in every single election cycle. And I guarantee you that the Oregonian makes none. None. Thank you, Mark Freiberg, Forum member. First of all, I want to thank you for the continued local commitment. I am, was frankly amazed at the coverage you've given the little Beaverton School Bond Committee, which is putting together a very important package for the voters. And you've been there in many key meetings. But my concern is more, more structural. And tell me if my perception's wrong. I'm seeing in the way I get, when I work Washington County, I am seeing less experienced reporters who seem to turn over in their beats much faster than they used to. And I'm worried about that institutional memory, that depth you used to see in reporters who sometimes would be on the beat for many years or even decades and develop a tremendous network. And I, I, what has changed there, if, if my perception is correct? Uh, well, we do have a number of newer people in Washington County, and, and that speaks to the fact that we've expanded the staff in Washington County. So uh, as we've expanded the staff in Washington County, we obviously have new people who don't have the institutional memory. The good news is that um, we are building that institutional memory, and in fact, in the editing teams that we have, they have been in place for a much longer period of time than some of these, some of these new reporters. We also have... Um, this interesting dynamic at work which we're trying to knock down and that is that uh, a reporter thinks that they're that they would be more important if they were covering Portland City Hall than if they were covering the Beaverton School Bond Committee right and as somebody who grew up in a in a small town I understand the value of local local news and what we're trying to instill in in all of our staff is Everything that you do has value to uh, to readers. Not every story is going to get a thousand or fourteen hundred comments. Some are going to get none, but the readership of those is going to be important. And we are going to have to rely on editors until we build back that institutional memory. But the but the trade off for us is to have fewer people who are there for a longer period of time, or to do what we have done, and that is expand the staff in Washington County significantly. And most of those, obviously, uh, those people are new, and some of them are younger. That also speaks to our digital focus, in that we are finding that um, a number of people we are able to hire now have already digital experience. And that's not necessarily the case if you take some of the folks who've been around for a long, long time. Yeah. Thanks. Harry Bodine has the last question. Harry, I didn't give you a softball question to ask, so you're on your own. Okay. <laughs> Harry Bodine, forum member and an Oregonian alum. <laughs> uh, and a terrific one, in case, you, in case those of you who don't know Harry, uh, an incredible alum of the Oregonian. Thank you, sir. Anyway, my question is this. Um, <clears throat> in the old days, there was a firewall between the editorial board and the reporting of the assignments in the newsroom and so forth. It was a, a definite editorial board wrote editorials, the new staff did not, and it was not bound by the editorial board's positions. Is that still the case? Indeed, it is the case. And in fact, when I came to the Oregonian, the editor of the editorial page reported to Sandy Rowe, the editor of the Oregonian, and I immediately changed that so that the editor of the Oregonian reports to me, and the editorial editor of the Oregonian reports to me separately from the editor. There is uh, no coordination, and some but not a huge amount of communication, except to gather information, between the folks writing editorials and the folks who are covering the news. It's very important to me to maintain that separation so that there is not a sense that somehow we're dictating coverage in the Oregonian predicated on, on editorials. And I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of that, of how that works, okay? The classic example of how that works is PERS, because we didn't write a single editorial about PERS until long after we had written a number of news articles about what was happening with the PERS system. So it's an interesting dynamic because some people would like to make the claim that because we have a position on PERS on the editorial page, that that would dictate our coverage. And in fact, it's exactly, uh, exactly wrong. As I said, coverage of PERS, and then that led to editorials. As you know, Harry, and as folks here might well want to know, and probably do know this if they follow it closely, largely editorials follow news coverage rather than the, rather than the other way around. 
we're trying to create and we did i think with some success in two thousand and thirteen and the agenda for the editorial page so that we are clear about what we stand for and on sunday we invited readers and users to join in with us to talk about what our agenda should be for 2014. There's some people who don't think we should have an agenda. Those are probably the same people who disagree with our editorials. Um, or they would like to have an agenda that's their agenda rather than an institutional agenda. But I want to assure you that there's a very clear distinction. Eric Lukens, our editorial and commentary editor, does not report to uh, Peter Batia, our editor. Uh, nor does he have any kind of regular communication with him. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to call for some applause for our amazing speaker. I'd like to wind down this meeting with a couple brief announcements. Uh, first, in two weeks we will reconvene. Next week we have a holiday and this forum will recess. Ellen Rosenblum, our Attorney General for the State of Oregon, will be here in two weeks. There's a gentleman in the room that I'd like to recognize. If this body is one that understands politics, there's an ultimate compromise going on. I go to a lot of public meetings, as many do you, and the art of balancing the right amount of sound to be loud enough for some of us who are hearing impaired and soft enough for those of us who are hearing sensitive is the ultimate task and skill of a politician. There's a man who's not one, and his name is Joseph Tyner, and I ask that you give him a round of applause. He has been a, a shining star in making sure that this forum proceeds, and I, want, I thank you for uh, helping me thank him. Uh, with that being said, I do want to remind anyone who'd like to attend our board meeting, uh, we meet the first Monday of the month, and that's uh, all I've got to say, so I hope to see you back in two weeks. Have a good day.